This episode of The Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is the Citadel Cafe, episode number 483 for Wednesday, August 7th, 2024. My name is Joel Duggan, and the Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we're into. The podcast is available on all of the major podcasting platforms, including YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please consider subscribing, liking, following, pushing the button that says you want more. It really does help us out a lot. Joining me this week, Stephen is back. That's Stephen ESC on all the social media that matters and Stephen ESC on Twitch, which also matters. Hello, sir. Hello, and how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Having a great summer. Nice. It is a little warm. I, I, will, I will say we're not supposed to talk about the weather. Uh, yeah. I, am, I am very done with being sweaty all of the time. Uh, so yes. we'll, we'll stay away from the weather and more about how I'm feeling. Uh, as someone that trains three to four times a week, I put up some good numbers. I've had good workouts on paper. The last two weeks but i have felt like garbage both before during and after it's just hot and and yeah. muggy really it's not so much the heat it's the humidity i find uh that really tanks me like to the point where i don't love leg day but i don't hate leg day either but there's a couple of times where i've just gone in for leg day like this is just going to suck the life out of me for the next 48 hours because it's just you just can't seem to get your your gusto back like your energy is just so done and then you're trying to do stuff yeah. around the house work stuff you know uh apartment stuff laundry stuff adulting stuff and y- your motivation is like zero because because it's warm but other than that uh without getting into uh, into the details i i'm having a very very good summer things are good that's awesome can't complain i've also as we will talk about later i'll give everybody a heads up uh we are going to be talking about deadpool and wolverine uh, Stephen and I did the whole like went to the theater in person thing together. Together, yeah. yeah. <laughs> even even had a beer and a burger ahead of time. That's right. It was a full blown date. It was. Yeah, hey, you're right. Yeah. Nice. Look at us. I I will say now that there will just be no way to talk about it without spoilers. Um, I'll warn you again before we actually talk about Deadpool. Uh, but. I would like people to at least have seen the film before listening to this because I don't want to dance around too much. And I had a couple things spoiled for me on social media. By this point, most people probably have because, uh, man, mm. the marketing for that film is everywhere. So good. <laughs> and it's also almost as funny as the movie, some of the marketing stuff that they're doing. So uh, yeah. I just want to let people know that that's, that's what's up. Um, but that was also fun. Like, it's just I've been spending time with friends, family, you know, just going to do in doing the little extra vacation time not like i'm taking big trips but i'm certainly taking like afternoons off or mornings off when i when i can and it's been really recharging because i was working a lot uh this past winter Mm. so it's nice to have the excuse of summer not that you really need summer to be excused to have a well-balanced life but it was uh it was time i think what's new with you um i've been on the flip side i've had a pretty busy summer so far so it's not not terrible just I guess things are going well work-wise. I actually start a new job tomorrow and things been things have been getting busy leading up to it and I was sort of surprised that they asked me to basically I'm I'm going from being a graphic designer to being a supervisor of the graphic design graphic design team and that's I thought, you know, for the last 5-10 years of my career that might be cool, but just with my current supervisor uh retiring and then the person who's going to replace him not actually staying as long as we originally thought. They just sort of asked me to do it. So now I've got a six month acting experience as supervisor of the design team. And I, I'm, uh, I'm both excited and terrified because I've, <laughs> I've never supervised a team before, but yeah, it's, it's going to be good. It felt like it's been busy and things have been good and things have kind of felt like they've been moving in my favor and sort of culminated to this and it, it wasn't expected i honestly didn't see it coming so we're just having a meeting and then it was just sort of like hey how would you like to do this <laughs> and then i just i sat there in the video call with just an absolutely blank face 
And I just, I, at one point I caught myself and I said, okay, please, please don't take my lack of expression for a lack of interest. I'm just, this is me stunned and processing. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been good, but busy. So, um, it's, uh, I've got a week vacation coming up at the end of the aug end of August. So I'm looking forward to, uh, relaxing a little bit, but yeah, things are good. That's something that I've not done in a very long time. I plan to take the Christmas holidays off. Like I usually stay away from the computer work for that week between Christmas and New Year's, but mm. I've not had like a, a week off or a planned trip anywhere in a very, very long time. And I think in part, uh, and not to brag, but I feel like I have a pretty decent work-life balance where like I, you know, like I don't feel uh, like I'm shackled to, to the desk all the time. And it That's helps good. that obviously I'm self-employed and that, you know, like I can, I, I can take care of a lot of other things that people have to do on like their evenings and weekends. Like I can do laundry at Tuesday on at 10 AM because like I could just do that while I do the admin stuff for the podcast or like whatever. Right. So that, right. that stuff is nice. I feel like I'm due. Like I, I feel like because of that, I never really fully disconnect. Like I'm just, I've always got emails coming into my phone or, you know, I'm always popping into the studio to do something. Certainly don't feel good sitting on the couch 20 feet from the studio playing video games on a rainy day when I know I could just be doing a little bit extra work. It's different when you can like get out and like be on a hike or be on a, or, you know, a road trip or something like that for the weekend. Unapologetically far away from your technology so you can, you, you have no choice but to relax. I mentioned it, I think on the spawn chunks render distance, but I don't think I've recorded the Citadel Cafe since, but uh, a dear friend, one of my best friends, Britt, was in town uh, mid-July. And so I took a couple of days to hang with her and then drive her down to Lunenburg. And so that was the first time that I've had that much time out of the studio where I really wasn't even checking my email for, mm. you know, over the course of a couple of days. And this is the first time I've done that in a very long time. So the mental note was more of that. Like that needs to happen <laughs> more often. Nice. And, uh, and I think having as we were just discussing buffer days on either side of that <laughs> to, yeah. oh to get goodness. back into the swing of things is, is always, is always good. Uh, but I, I think we should probably just dive right in because I think it's going to be a, a good discussion. Uh, I do want to kick off with something a little bit related, but uh, just kind of worth mentioning as well. Uh, so in front of Deadpool and Wolverine, something that I had actually seen via YouTube a couple of days before, was the trailer for Captain America Brave New World, uh, or a teaser trailer, I guess, technically. Mm -hmm. It yeah. dropped on July 12th. It is in theaters February 14th, 2025. And uh, it has Harrison Ford taking over from William Hurt as Thunderbolt Ross. It's got Anthony Mackie coming back as Captain America, formerly the Falcon, but obviously in the Winter Soldier series, took on the mantle. And then uh, you have to pay real close attention, but there's another Falcon. There's another Falcon suit in the trailer. Uh, I can't remember the actor's name, but the uh, kind of military sidekick Falcony guy that he had in the series is taking up right. what looks like the role of Falcon now. And uh, there was, uh, I can't remember the character's name. It was the older Captain America that was in that series as well. The older um, black gentleman that right. was like part of Vietnam or something like that. He was also a super soldier, part of that program gone wrong. And he's, he's in it as well. Um, the thinker is uh, one of the main villains, if not the main villain. And that is um, from the Ed Norton Hulk. He was the scientist that had oh, yeah. gamma radiation kind of emptied into his brain. And his head started to kind of bubble and stuff at the end of that movie. So that's where that's coming from. And the reveal at the end of the trailer is that Red Hulk is in it. And if you know your comics, Red Hulk is Thunderbolt Ross. So we're going to get to see Harrison Ford oh. uh, mo-capped into Red Hulk for this film at some point. So that's going to be pretty cool, I think. Uh, I like the trailer. I thought it had a lot of good pacing and good kind of I'm on board. Like I, I like that. It, it feels different. Like it's, it's, it's not anti-establishment, but it's certainly cautious about that. The 
premise in the trailer is that President Ross, he's the president of the United States now, wants to bring Captain America back as an official military, U.S. military agent. And the crux, I think, in the caution is a line from um, Sam saying, and what if I don't agree with how you want to handle mm. the situation? Like, how how does that go down? Right. And then there's all this other stuff that ensues. And um, oh, also, um, I'm blanking on his name. He was in Breaking Bad and The Mandalorian. He's also in it. Um, Juan Carlo Esposito, what's his name? He, um, yeah, he's in it. He plays a villain. I can't remember the villain's name. Apparently, it's from from the um, from the comics though. Yeah, it's the King of the Serpent Society. Seth Volker, Sidewinder? a.k.a. Sidewinder. That's it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's snakes. I knew there were snakes involved, but um, there was this really funny moment when I saw him announcing, like, and I'm in the film, and I'm Sidewinder. And I'm like, yeah. who is that? <laughs> like, I, You said that like <laughs> I'm supposed to know who that is, and I've got no fucking idea who you're talking about. So it was interesting, to uh, to say the least. Maybe he's a villain of the week. Yeah, I honestly don't know who his character is either. So what did you think of the trailer? Because that was in front of Deadpool, and that, I think, was the first time you saw it. Um, I had... it was. I actually enjoyed it as well. I think I, I caught parts of it online, and then I, I decided to not watch it because I thought, oh, I just want to come into this not knowing a ton. So there's just... I'm just always leery of being overspoiled, so I was a little... Just before I saw it, a little disappointed that I was catching it. But then I, you know, I saw it and it, it didn't really feel like it gave away a ton. It basically set up some key plot points, but didn't give you any real indication of how they were going to go down, which I thought was, which is, the, that's the kind of trailer I like. And I'm kind of grateful for that because it makes you, it's, it sets it up in a, well, for me anyway, it set it up in a way that made me want to go see like how all these little things were going to resolve in the movie. So yeah, it was good. I think we'll talk about this a little bit later too, is that some of the trailers for Marvel films lately and Marvel series have felt pretty desperate. Like they feel like they've had to kind of beat you over the head with <laughs> what is going to happen. Like, no, no, it's good. You should really come see it. Yeah. In the exact opposite way, the trailer for the acolyte was completely misleading and just <laughs> was not at all what the show was like. So you can go down the road of like not revealing enough, and then people just get excited and draw their own conclusions and then are ultimately disappointed when you hinted at what could happen and then that didn't happen at all. So, yeah, I uh, I know what you mean, though. I, I was talking with Ryan Murphy recently and we were talking about Deadpool and he had seen it. And while he was spoiled via social media, he said mm. that he had watched all the official trailers going into it just because he had seen them online. And he said that he was relieved that the trailers while they did have some big moments, they really didn't reveal everything about the movie. And also sometimes the sequences in which things were filmed and the dialogue and the order of the dialogue in the trailers were either not the same way they were delivered in the film or just not in the right. film at all. Some of the stuff from the trailer just did not show up in the film. And, yeah. and I think that that's, that's a decent way to do it too, because that way people are not like, expecting a certain line a certain way or uh feel like they have been spoiled by the trailer if the trailer is just a little bit different yeah well i mean it also comes from the fact that they prepare the trailer before they're done editing the full movie so it could have been something True. that was intended or like on the verge of being intended in the movie and they kind of went ah oh, we don't have enough we have to get rid of that scene which means the line goes yeah it was a jim carrey movie what was it uh the one where he was sort of on a tv oh the truman the truman show it was the first time I had ever actually experienced a trailer with a part in it that would just straight up, they straight up removed it from the movie. And I thought it would have, it would have been a lot more, it would have given it away. Either way, it was one of those things that, or when I learned that it's not, not everything in the trailer makes it in. So did you watch any of the news coming out of um, Comic-Con this weekend? I did. Yes. And overall thought it was pretty cool. I'm actually looking forward to the, um, the Thunderbolts, is that what they're called? I'm, I'm a little blanking on the names as we're talking. But yeah, that's now. with um, Lawrence Pugh and oh yeah, David Sebastian Harbour Stan. And Sebastian Stan. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I forget all of the actors' names, but Ghost from 
Ant-Man and the Wasp. I'm glad she's coming back. I thought that was a really cool character, and I think it's a little unfortunate that there was that much time between her introduction and when she's coming back. Now, I think it'll I think it'll be good. I mean, it's essentially Marvel's Suicide Squad, right? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. But I, I, I mean, I like all of these characters, and I think the guy who plays the uh, the U.S. agent, Captain America, one point five. <laughs> yeah, I actually think he he's a decent actor, and I think he did a good job of. I, I thought he was really earnestly wanting to be a good next Captain America, and I thought he did a good job of that. And like, both the actor and both the soldier himself are fighting against nobody really wanting him to be or nobody really seeing him as the next Captain America. So I, I liked his performance and stuff. So I'm really interested to see how he'll flip into being the U.S. agent. And like, maybe he's just realizing now he doesn't have to try to be the next Captain America, or maybe he's still going to try to be the next Captain America. I don't know. I think I'm interested to see how that goes. Yeah. Wyatt Russell is a good actor. I like him. Yeah. And then Bucky, I'm curious to see what they're going to do with him, but I almost feel, I mean, this is an assumption on my part that he's just tired of the fight almost. He just seemed like he was just trying to make amends with everyone he wronged in the uh, the um, Falcon and Winter Soldier. So it'll be interesting to see how they bring his character back into the fold. I really miss the dynamic between the Falcon and Bucky. And I know that that has to change with the Falcon becoming Captain America, but I am also here for whatever chemistry we can get between. Is it Yelena? Is that? Yeah. Is that her name? The character's name? Yes. And, yeah. and Bucky. Like, I feel like grumpy winter soldier <laughs> meets a uh, wise Kraken, you know, assassin Yelena is going to be hilarious. I feel like it's going to yeah. be uh, some good on-screen chemistry. They're also both really good actors and just seem to have that, that their characters. I think they have them nailed down. Uh, less excited about David Harbour. I didn't really enjoy him in the Black Widow movie at all. So, um, no, 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 I just, I like him. I think David Harbour's a great actor. I really liked him in Stranger Things and he was great in Hellboy. Um, yeah. but, but I, I just, the, the, the character, I can't remember the character's name, the Russian something, um, is just not, not my cup of tea. I, I, I find it, I find it cartoonish and that could be, the character's fault, not David Harbour's fault, but I, yeah, it's not my, not my favorite. Uh, did you see the big reveal on the Doctor Doom casting? Yes, and I have mixed feelings about that. I think along with a lot of other people on the internet, it's like, I it, it depends if if they leave. Um, I guess we're talking about for people who haven't seen it, the reveal was, and they weren't being subtle about it at all. But the reveal was that Robert Downey Jr. is coming back to the MCU, but as Doctor Doom. And if they leave his mask on, it's going to be great because he's a fantastic actor and then and he'll bring a completely different take on the character. But then there's other people speculating that he's going to be like alternate universe Tony Stark. And that's just a guess. I mean, it's just, I don't think I would care for that. That would make my eyes roll enough that you'd be able to hear it. It just, he had such an excellent exit from this series that it would just be, it would just cheapen it if they brought him back. I feel anyway. Same. I can see it in like a Tom Hardy Bane sort of way. Like you totally just forget that that's Tom Hardy, right? Uh, because he's got the yes. mask on the whole time. And I, I feel like they could do the same thing with Robert Dar Downey Jr. To the point where they could have almost not revealed that he was in it, you know? But the the marketing train for these things is just so big that I also feel like Marvel Disney knows that they're floundering a bit and by yeah. <laughs> trouncing Robert Downey Jr. out on stage on Hall H is a good way to get a lot of attention, but I don't know if it got the attention that they wanted. I've not really seen anybody go, yes, this is going to be amazing. Uh, a lot of people cheered at Comic-Con, but like, were they cheering because they were 400 feet away from Robert Downey Jr. or were they just cheering yeah. because he was back in that character, right? Like I just, uh, but I would not be surprised and would be just as disappointed if they brought a multiverse Tony Stark in as Doctor Doom and it was not Victor Von Doom. There's just, there's something about that that feels very 
desperate, desperate? slash <laughs> I just said the same thing just cash grabby you know it just and I, on one hand it's like you're trying to get the dollars and the butts and the chairs but it's like you also got to pay robert downey jr like that he's not cheap like that's no you know that's not how you balance the books friends <laughs> uh so now, i don't know bringing the russo brothers back to do dir- to direct the um oh that's fine yeah avengers doomsday and avengers secret wars is is cool but then it just it felt like bringing those two back and then bringing Robert Downey Jr. back and almost I think that's where it felt like a little re- remember when we were great we're, we're going to do that again we're bringing back the recipe mm-hmm. of, and it's just a uh, yeah. yeah yeah I'm hopeful I'm 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 cautiously optimistic um but they really could have picked from a you know a huge pool of wonderful actors who would have cost a fraction of what they have to pay him as you were saying so mm. I don't know see how it plays out well, speaking of pulling the Marvel Universe out of the shitter, <laughs> those were some of the jokes that were made in the Deadpool Wolverine yeah. movie. There was there was no shot <laughs> held back during the um, writing of, of this film. And so once again, I will give everyone a spoiler warning before Steven and I talk about our experience watching Deadpool and Wolverine. It's just not worth tap dancing around all the little things because I think some of the things that I enjoyed the most about the film are either spoiler heavy or just really subtle things that are worth experiencing on your own and relishing rather than having someone tell you to look for it in the film. So once again, if you are worried about spoilers, tune out, come back in a little bit, maybe look for the end of the show with the internet minute or whatever, or just, you know, go see the film and then come back and listen to us next time. This is going to be a really fun discussion because this is the first time in a while that one, I've gone to the theater. I think mm-hmm. the last time might have been Top Gun Maverick. Oh, wow. Oh, no. Sorry. Lie. I would have gone to see the Guardians of the Galaxy Part 3. So. Right. That was also a very poor technical experience, which I won't go into now. But this was a very good experience. Uh, I thought it was just kind of first impressions, entertaining, energetic. I felt kind of energetic and like, you know, talkative and excited when I left the the film. You know, you and I just on the drive home, just kind of talking about all the different stuff we just experienced. And there was so much going on and there Mm -hmm. were so many good feelings throughout the film of jokes and good moments and surprises that it was just hard to articulate because like the moment that you thought about one thing to say, you remembered something else that happened like, oh, yeah, that was (laughs) cool. But then, oh, but the other thing. And so like it just it becomes. It's it's almost challenging to talk about it on a podcast because like I can't remember all of it. Like there's just so much coming at you. Uh, it reminds me of like the the discussion I had with Brock at years ago about the scripts for the Gilmore Girls, where the average script for a, a television hour long drama is something like forty five to fifty pages, and Gilmore Girls were steadily like in the sixties or seventies because there's just that much dialogue in the show it's just constant talk 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 yeah there's an exhausting amount deadpool is like that he just never shuts up and it's all funny but like you're still laughing at one thing and you miss the next thing and there were a couple of things in the theater that i 100 percent missed um not because um of any fault of the delivery it's just that it struck the audience so funny that most of us were laughing and you just completely missed the next thing that was said because you couldn't quite hear yeah. it you know, it's one after another. Yeah, it was really, really good in that way. So overall, I, I will say 110% worth seeing in the theater and worth seeing with an audience because I thought it was more enjoyable with a full theater full of people laughing at, at all the jokes. Yeah, I, I'm sure it would have been just as fine, you know, with a half theater, but there's just something really cool about seeing something like this in the first four or five days that it's out because you know that everybody's there for the first time and it's just going to be a good time yeah and if you liked the first two deadpool movies you'll you'll like this because it's just more of the same and i i mean that in a really good way not in a bad way at all so i have some small grievances with it but i i really like the pace overall i thought the opening scene where just like in the first movie they start off with this action sequence and then like with all the slow motion like bullet time happening deadpool's like well we have to back up a bit before you can really understand the predicament that I'm in sort of thing. And I feel like with this opening sequence, they did the same thing. They start with this just ridiculous opener of 
Deadpool murdering TVA agents, you have no explanation as to why they're no. trying to get him. Like just you, you know, the big orange portal that they come through. If you've watched Loki, you know what these people are. And then he is murdering them. And you find out that he's murdering them with the adamantium corpse of Logan from the Fox universe Wolverine <laughs> to bye, 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 by InSync. <laughs> complete yeah. with all of the dance moves, perfect choreography to the music video combined with action sequence of him, like, you know, triple somersaulting over and sticking a thumb into somebody's forehead. Like it's just, it's, just, it's wild. Uh, yeah. And uh, right down to the point where like he uses leather and skin to strap Wolverine claws to his forearms and starts Wolverining everybody. Like it is, it's yeah. pretty wild. There's like crotch shots and all kinds of nonsense. Yeah, and it's funny as he was using the Wolverine claws. There's one point where he just he kept messing up. He's like, "Oh, Wolverining's hard," or or something like that. It's funny though you mentioned like the pacing of that is. I felt that part was a little bit long. Like it was almost they almost played the entire end sync song. I felt and it just I enjoyed it. I like I liked all of the bits, but they they kept cutting to the dance sequence over and over and over again. And I felt like, you know, even if they trimmed it thirty seconds, because it felt long, like fifteen to thirty seconds, and then made it a little bit more tight but yeah i mean overall i agree the, the pacing of the overall movie was fantastic they do tend to do that with deadpool stuff and that's one of my positives about this is that it was not filled with awkward comedy there were some but they were short ish for awkward comedy and not every 10 minutes i really had a problem with deadpool too uh, in that way i overall i liked it but i felt that there were some real draggy scenes where it's just like i made a joke did you get the joke we're gonna hang on the joke are we still hanging on the joke mm. long look at the camera enjoy the joke it's just like no could you just <laughs> fucking move on because i i don't find that funny and i know that's a personal thing but they didn't do that very much in in deadpool and wolverine which i appreciated and i think that that was mostly centered around dog pool which was when they get into the multiverse, there's all these different Deadpools and Dogpool is the ugliest dog in the world. It's a little Pomeranian pug mix thing. I was actually wondering that. Is it is it the ugliest dog? There was a there was a clip. It's not the ugliest dog in the world, but it's a it won Britain's ugliest dog competition. Uh, but it's like this scraggly looking the kind of dog that looks soaking wet even when it's dry and it's got some sort of jaw or hygiene problem where the tongue is like hanging out of its mouth all the time. The jaw is crooked. It looks like it's missing most of its fur. And... Yeah, it's it's really yeah. it's a it's a hard looking animal. But they pause the the action and or anything else happening in the movie whenever the dog makes an appearance. And I feel <laughs> like that in some times was a poor choice. Like it really kind of it wasn't funny. It was like you this was going really well until just now. The the one thing that I thought was going to be longer and I'm glad it wasn't was there's a spot where they first meet the dog and Deadpool's really excited about holding the dog and this dog is licking Ryan Reynolds in the face, like up his nose, in his mouth, and Ryan Reynolds is kind of just standing there and taking it. And they it's it's a long time, but it's not yeah. as long as they probably could have and probably wanted to and i'm glad that they resisted because it was just it was funny and it was funny enough but i didn't like i didn't have that idea of like okay guys move on it was your reaction was like oh my god <laughs> and just yeah. you had just enough time to make that reaction and then they started to move on i was like okay that's you know that to me was was good but there were some other dog pool moments where it's like i i don't care about the slow-mo running dog i really i really don't i thought the um the writing and the dialogue was also really sharp they have so much going on i feel like while there is a ton of dialogue in the film because of all the things that they wanted to say they had to be very concise with it so there's not a lot of rambling if, like whenever someone's speaking like everything that they are saying feels important i know that deadpool kind of goes off on these tangents but like those are the jokes so like you can't not listen to what he's saying because otherwise you're going to miss the punchline and yeah. any other time and like in contrast whenever uh logan wolverine is is speaking i mean he's pretty gruff and man a few words for the first chunk of the film but when he speaks again like economy and what he's saying matters he doesn't 
just grumble and repeat the same like you know fuck off wait or whatever like he doesn't just say the same thing over and over again he has a couple of lines like that but they're more for fan service and when he actually does speak about something and you hear about his past what he was like in his universe why he's regarded as the worst wolverine all those different things they they really don't pull back like they they ha- they all have meaning it's not there's not a lot of like tennis that goes back and forth with the actors there's it's all mm. really solid pitches back and forth which i i really appreciated and um and of course like the the jokes were just nonstop. like they deadpool refers to himself as marvel jesus in the first 15 minutes of the movie <laughs> and like he's gonna save everything we're bringing there's like there's all these moments where like they enter the void and they walk by like this decrepit crumbled 20th century fox logo and I mean, I think Deadpool even says at one point, he looks right at the camera, goes, fuck you, Fox. I'm going to Disney World. And you just come like, yeah. oh, my God, <laughs> like this is just <laughs> ridiculous the way that he's going about this. And they poke fun at like, well, we all know the Marvel Universe is in the best spot right now. Or like he welcome to the Marvel Universe when when Logan crosses through the dimensions. Uh, you're entering at a low point, I think, is the line. I'm like, that is <laughs> wow. Like that's. <laughs> that's interesting you know like the feige signed off on that you know like it just that that stuff i thought was really poignant and i think important like i think important for marvel disney to acknowledge because then the fans feel seen and heard because they've been saying that for a little while like you guys are dropping the ball here with some of our favorite stuff like what happened why is it going so crappy so quickly it's not superhero exhaustion it's bad writing and bad decisions like could you get back on track please and thank you you know I never really thought about it until you mentioned it, but it's it's actually probably doing themselves a favor in so many ways as well, because it's almost like, okay, okay, cool. Like now, now we can, we've said it, we've admitted it and we can just sort of like shake it off and get back down to business kind of thing. So as opposed to just pretending that everything's been all right all along, it's almost like not necessarily a fully clean slate, but it actually almost, I think it, it works in their favor. I think what it does is it lets the audience know that they're trying again as opposed to coasting because coasting is not like what they were making was garbage it just wasn't really hitting the mark and granted it's hard to repeat like 19 films over 10 years uh leading up to endgame but yeah it's also easy to point the finger and just like you guys are coasting like you're just you you think that you've got it made but you have to remember the reason why those films were so successful is because there was immense effort behind everything and you have to mm-hmm. continue that uh in order for it to be to be good and especially if you're dealing with new characters and uh you know new things that you want to do on uh new formats as well like series on disney plus versus films and all that stuff i think that they just have to make sure that i think if the audience knows that they're trying then they'll be a lot more forgiving it doesn't have to be a blockbuster but if they like really try to make a good film and tell a good story with good characters and i think that people are just like yeah okay i'll respect it like i'm not going to slam it for being a money grab or lazy or um because that's really the thing like lazy writing really gets any studio into trouble i think yeah fans are smart enough these days to pick up on that and so many of the the later marvel movies i thought anyway they they all try to make they try to make so many of them do so many things in one movie that there was never like you couldn't I'm not sure the best way to say it, but like nothing felt dear to me. Like it, it didn't take its time, didn't kind of give you those moments where you you could latch onto a character or really get a sense of, you know, buy into their fight or whatever it was in the movie. It was just so much going on and you've got to save Earth from another multiverse or other universe threat coming in. It's just it was all over the place. So, I mean, I knew this was a multiverse movie, but it felt very much focused on like the task that they needed to do. It wasn't an entire race of aliens coming from another universe that was going to crush earth. It was like Deadpool wants to save his nine favorite people on the planet. That's it. And it kind of borrowed from other movies, but that, that was the main, his main goal. Having a simple plot like that really helps because heroes journeys are always a little bit more straightforward in that way. Mm -hmm. They, they, They get complicated over the adventure, but the character motivation has to be, fairly simple or at least simple to understand from the audience point of view and it can get 
complicated with the other characters you meet along the way, the obstacles that you have to overcome, but your motivation has to be pretty steadfast, I think, and and easy for the average person to to grapple with. And I think, you know, protecting your fam- friends and family is a, is a pretty straightforward one for everybody to identify with. And I think it also helps with Deadpool being so foul mouthed and so violent and so prone to just killing people that <laughs> to have that kind of honorable intention. Yeah. That helps with getting behind. Cause I've never really been a big anti-hero person, but I really didn't feel so much that Wolverine and Deadpool were anti-heroes in this. I really felt like they were more just trying to do the right thing for the people around them. Yeah, I guess that was a li- a little bit of a B for me. I agree fully, but I felt like at the beginning it was almost like Deadpool's character Wade was trying to like I don't know. It felt like it was being laid on too thick. Like I just want to do the right thing. I want to do right by my girl. I want to I want to sign up for the Avengers. I want to do that. It just almost felt like it was you know too too bonk you over the head. So that it it felt like it lacked a bit of sincerity for me. But but overall, I I appreciate that desire as opposed to being like f everything. We're just going down this road and killing a bunch of people. I feel like it was a bit delusional. And maybe they were going for that, but then it came across as insincere. Yeah, fair enough. Instead, like, I mean, it's a fine line. Like, I I think that that because of the nature of the movie and it's so tongue in cheek and so fourth wall breaking that I think that you can cross that line sometimes when you don't want to in terms of being delusional versus insincere. I really hated the toupee. Like I just, I couldn't wait for him to not be in. The t- like it looked so stupid. I, I just, it yeah. was awful. I couldn't wait for that to just like, go away. This is Ken doll hair. Totally. I mean, I know it was not meant to look good. Like I understand that they were doing it on purpose, but there's just something about that stuff that just irks me. Just a, th- a thought back to the in- insincerity part with, or maybe a reason it felt insincere is because we're used to seeing Deadpool as so cheeky and sarcastic all the time so that maybe it was because just that's the delivery that i'm used to from him because when hugh jackman was giving these like earnest lines he it's it was a comedic comedy action movie superhero movie and he was acting the hell out of his scenes like oh he my was gosh, yeah he's like he's a workhorse and everything but it just i felt like he was just, just like his scenes where he was upset or just angry he was just killing it so i, I really enjoyed his dramatic performances in this throughout the entire thing. That's one of the things that I had down as one of the subtle things that you don't expect to get out of this movie. Cause you go in, you think, you know what you're getting, right? Yeah. But even the scenes from Jackson's acting when he wasn't saying anything, like he's just recalling mistakes he'd made in his world that resulted in all of his X-Men brothers and sisters dying. And it was his fault. And then what he did after and he starts to explain, but then he kind of drifts off into, you know, space and just in thought, but there's just so much going on in his face. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and then when Cassandra Nova gets inside his head and we get to see like the, the tank top and jeans Wolverine costume where he's kind of walking past all these X-Men gravestones, which are not, it's not like a literal graveyard. It's like this monolith type things. It's like a, uh, metaphor for how he's feeling this oh. gra- graves lined up into the distance where you can't see the end of them like that kind of stuff and imagery like, surrealistic imagery of the mind and but like with the acting in those scenes especially with cassandra nova f- f- like fluttering around and like manipulating him and you know that they're torturing him and stuff like it, it's mm-hmm. it's a really good really good scene uh and th- i mean one of many 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 um, the other one where he's furious, like he's angry. He's screaming at Deadpool in the car talking about, oh, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you're such a failure. The X-Men didn't take you. They take anybody like he just he just he goes deep. He cuts deep on on Deadpool. And it's it's a, a fast paced, angry, angry monologue. But it it doesn't sound rehearsed like it doesn't no. sound. um bloated every again economy of dialogue everything has meaning there's just there's just enough language in there to make it sound like a real person talking and not reading a script but it's just it's so well done 
and I just yeah. I really enjoy his screen presence in everything. I I'm a big Hugh Jackman fan, but I him in this film and him as Wolverine in general just kind of has like a scene stealing, screen filling presence, which I I really admire. And speaking of that car scene, it was uh, when you see in the trailer so much fighting going on between Deadpool and Wolverine. You're like, really? Are they just going to fight each other? Are they really that angry at each other that whole time? But that that scene you just mentioned where he lays into Deadpool and then Deadpool just can't even say anything. He's just he's silent and then goes, I'm going to fight you now. That build up and that him laying into him like that was fuel for that fight. And then the fight afterwards was just really, really cool. But I was I was wondering how they're just going to make these two fight each other, the, like justify having these two fight each other through the whole movie. But but that that one scene where he just lays into him, it was just justifi- justification enough to just <laughs> have them beat the tar out of each other. It was a uh, it was good. And you've got these <laughs> these two invincible guys just who can't die. So they get to be extra violent and crazy. But it's you know no body count in the fight between the two of them. They are who they are. But it was, no, it was good. I had some questions about that, actually, because Logan in the. 20th century Fox universe, but the one, the movie Logan, when he dies at the right. end, he's stabbed through the heart with a huge tree stump branch. And I understand that Wolverine and Deadpool can heal. And that's why them stabbing one another with like uh, adamantium katanas and adamantium claws and baby knife, which was funny every time. <laughs> like i forgot about that but that, man, i just remembered that was so it. good yeah <laughs> just remembered it now we'll just we'll just leave it at that people baby knife it was just it was it was good yeah like that that kind of stuff um it was over <laughs> the top with all the the stabbing and like there are lots of times where wolverine absolutely stabbed deadpool through the heart with claws uh and vice versa katanas right through the left middle of the chest like that is that is through you that is not a flesh wound that is that is through you and i understand that they heal but like refresh my memory did logan lose all of his ability to heal at the end of that logan film like is that why he died there i thought so like he he was getting old because he was no longer healing yeah we're healing properly and like if you're i think it was x-men one or maybe two he had been he basically got pinned against the wall of the inside of a helicopter i think it was like magneto forced him against the wall and like magnetically has turned his fists around it was inside the statue of liberty yeah yeah aimed at his chest and so he actually shot shot his claws through his chest through his heart to shove himself off the wall so he's he's he said he's been punched through the heart before and in so like I didn't I didn't mind I didn't mind that too much in Deadpool because I've seen it before. It was the Logan circumstances. He also took some sort yeah. of like hype up serum right before he did that, which I guess on the other side of that would have diminished his healing ability as well. So yeah, I mm-hmm. there, I knew there was some sort of like caveat, but there's like some part of it just sort of like to your point about them fighting each other for a good part of the middle act, like the the, the good part of the bulk of the the movie, they're basically stabbing each other all the time, and it just gets to the point where like. We know you can't die. You both know you can't die. So why are we still doing this? Like, I understand like a couple of shots is funny, but like this is a long fight sequence. And we both know from the trailers and from who you are that this is going to end up with you guys fighting alongside of each other. So it's just it felt a little bit long to me. Mm. It was cool to watch in some of the action sequences. and obviously funny, you know, different jokes from 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 Deadpool. But yeah, it got a little bit a little bit long for me in some places. Mm. I I did, of course, really like a lot of the other casting as well. I mean, obviously Reynolds and Jackman are great. We've talked about that. Uh, but Emma Corrin as Cassandra Nova, uh, I had previously oh. seen them in The Crown and I didn't recognize them at first, but they play a young Diana Spencer before she marries oh, Prince yeah. Charles in, in the film or in the, in the show. Uh, they have a haunting screen presence. Holy crap very pretty but very sad at the same time yeah and the character nova has a condescension and melancholy about them that is really unnerving and something else that was really subtle about the way that the character was portrayed on screen uh i'm curious if anybody else caught this or if you caught this they have extra long fingers in the film oh really yeah every now and then like when she walks around the corner, she goes down the subway stairs and the camera's at like waist height 
when she's walking around her, I guess you could call it a throne room, Cassandra Nova in, in the film. Now, Emma Corrin is already a tall actor. They're 5'8 and very slender. But if mm-hmm. you watch it, like Cassandra Nova's fingers are like an extra knuckle longer in, in the movie. And it, it's, it's not quite alien, but it's long enough for you to go like those arms, like fingers don't go that far down your leg. Right. It just, it just, it just struck me immediately. And because of the way that Nova manipulates thoughts and emotions, unlike Charles Xavier, who apparently is their brother, they have to contact you. Like they have to touch you. And so they put, like they kind of pass their hand through your head and like, yeah play around with your brain by moving the fingers and flexing and retracting the digits and it just it looks incredibly uncomfortable uh for the people that are being probed <laughs> essentially yeah and 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 it was i thought that like was convincingly done too some of the cgi sometimes for that sort of thing looks cheap yeah but i, I was i was actually i found myself looking for it to look fake and I thought I thought they nailed that special effect. That was pretty good. It was yeah, I agree. It was sufficiently creepy, and it was that was well done. Yeah, especially brought on by the expressions of the actor that was receiving it. You know, like oh yes, whoever had their their brain being scrambled. Sometimes Cassandra Nova was being subtle. I think with Wolverine, it was just an index finger to the temple, like it's just like whoop, just like a pencil. Yeah, but then with <laughs> like the dude from the TVA, like she had her oh, like, fingers in his eye sockets like a bowling ball. Like it was just yeah, um, yeah. it was yeah. really not in a violent way because they're it's telekinetic. Like they're they're passing through the the head of the other person. They're not like piercing an eyeball like Game of Thrones. It's it's very power heavy it's not literally poking holes in people's brains but yeah really unnerving and and very subtle the way that the way that they handled like the extra finger length thing it was really really bizarre i agree i mean emma corin did a phenomenal job they were a, a solid a solid solid addition to the the cast what did you think of all the cameos loved them <laughs> like uh marvel royalty basically is how this character was introduced and I was so excited. I was so excited. And then it was just such a flip. They were talking to this guy in a hood. He was looking down and then, <laughs> and then Deadpool goes <gasps> and basically does that, you know, that home alone hands to the face thing that he usually does in his movies. And it's basically Marvel royalty, Marvel royalty. And then it turns around and then the person takes the hood off and it's Chris Evans. And I was like, Oh my goodness, Captain America. And I, I even was like, out loud in the theater i was so excited to see him again just thought maybe those happen for a brief moment <laughs> and then and then he takes the rest of the robe off and he, or like he just lights up on fire and flies off and it suddenly is johnny johnny storm so like back from when it was early 2000s fantastic four chris evans was like oh that was so good that was they totally got me on that one it was such a good such a good twist on that I didn't know what they were going to do because I feel like Deadpool was like waiting for him to say Avengers Assemble. You're not going to like what I say next. And then you <laughs> flame on and he takes off into the sky. Uh, I like that as well. I had one, two cameos spoiled for me. I saw they put X-23 Lara from the Logan film in a trailer, which I thought yeah. was, was, I really wish they hadn't done that. Should have kept her secret yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And then Blade was spoiled for me by a social media interview with Wesley Snipes. Yeah. And once I knew that he was talking about Ryan Reynolds asking him to make a cameo, I was like, oh, all right, well, he's going to be in it. I didn't know what to what extent, but like I wasn't surprised to see him. And honestly, that that was one cameo where like I just didn't really care. The Blade movies were cool, but like I don't I always thought about them as just like a cool vampire action movie. I completely forgot that Blade was a Marvel character. So mm. I was not expecting them to to bring them back. Uh, but I do remember, of course, Jennifer Garner yeah. as Elektra in the, cool the previous see. films. Yeah, the D- Daredevil and whatnot. And uh, she looks fantastic. Like she came back like and they updated the costumes for everybody. And But I feel like she really had some cool scenes, some cool things to add. Laura had the most heart, I think, to add, as you would expect, because of the relationship yeah. that that X-23 Lara would have with with Logan, even though it's not this Logan, they they had some really good back and forth. And I think one of the best lines of the whole film is when 
Lara and Logan are talking by like a campfire and mm. she's trying to get him to help. Like, we can't do this without you. They're taking on Cassandra Nova and the squad, the, the evil people. And Logan's just like, I'm the wrong guy. I've always been the wrong guy or something like that. And, but Lara's line is you always were until you weren't basically yeah. until you decide to help. And that's when you become like the best. And that lines in the trailer, which was just, I mean, it was, I, I didn't quite have it sink in fully when I saw the trailer, thankfully, because it's when they deliver it in the movie, it's, it's different in the movie. Looking back at the trailer. Well, why would you put that line in the trailer because it is it, it just felt like it was so key in the movie and yeah and like i said i'm glad it didn't like sink in the way like its importance didn't sink in fully in the trailer because you hadn't seen the entire thing but it is such a key moment in the yeah weird that they would give it away in the trailer i think that at that point in the film you know what happened in wolverine's past so i think that that's probably key because that's after they have the first encounter with cassandra nova i think with regards to Wolverine's past, I mean, I feel like maybe I forgot, maybe not forgot, but maybe I missed something because it almost felt like the way they explained why he was so, I don't get why he was the worst Wolverine, I guess I'd say, because he was just drinking all the time. So he was drinking all the time. He wasn't a team player. He, I think, would go too far and kill people. And he went on a bender. And while he was on a bender, the U.S. government attacked Xavier's school and killed everybody. And he didn't die because he wasn't there. He mm. didn't save anybody because he wasn't there. He w and he wasn't on a mission. Like, he was down the road drinking. Like, he was just forgetting his responsibilities and his trouble. And then he came back. Okay. And it was not just the guilt of not being there for these people that had given so much to him. But then he went on a murder rampage and killed all of the people that killed the X-Men in his world. Like, uh, he, re like he, he was the reason why humanity turned against mutants because he went on a spree. And that was, gotcha. the, that was the gist of it. I, there's a couple of things in the film that because of how fast paced it is, I missed as well. That was one that I caught. I'm curious whether you might be able to answer this, though. So <laughs> one of the big beefs that I have, I say beef, it's, it's a small beef, is I don't know why the TVA pulled Deadpool out of his universe to tell him it was dying. Because he is the reason, and that is the reason why their plan failed. Because if they just left him in there and left that timeline die, then end of story. If you don't tell him it's dying and don't pull him out of it and tell him who you are, then your desired outcome happens as you desire it like i so i i missed the part why the tva what was his name mr perfection mr no um paradox paradox mr paradox is kind of like the antagonist in um the tva for these guys he pulls deadpool out he says all you have to do is something don't you want to just matter i can get you from your shit universe into the main timeline, like the Avengers timeline, you can be there, but I don't know why. Like, I don't know why they pulled him other than the script says so. Do you remember? Because I, I think I missed it. I could be wrong, but I thought it was more of a self-referential thing. But from like, instead of Deadpool being self-referential, it was more like right. Disney. We need to pull Deadpool from his world to get him over into the MCU kind of thing. Uh, so like even, yeah, even Mr. Paradox was. was like, I don't even know why. They didn't tell me why I have to pull you out. We're just going to pull you out. Oh, they didn't tell me why upstairs you're pulling. Maybe that's it. I, I want to go see it again. So, yeah, I, I think you're right. So it, it, there, Again, like one problem with something coming at you 100 miles an hour for two hours <laughs> straight is like it's impossible yeah. to retain everything. And I feel like there was also a lot of jokes in that TVA control room happening. And so, like, you're laughing at something. He's like, did I just miss an important plot point? Like, what just happened? And I still want to know why Thor is crying. Oh, yeah. They totally don't explain that at all. Which I think is hilarious. But at the same time, it's just, it's like, it's coming in another movie. It's got to. Deadpool is clinging to this image of Thor holding him and weeping the entire film. 
Like it's just, yeah. it, it becomes part of his motivation, which I it, thought. It's was... on a TV screen in the TVA. Yeah. And he goes, wait, why is Thor crying? And that's it. That's, that's all you see. <laughs> yeah, that's all you but he, he keeps bringing it up. So that was good. So, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but it felt like I was, I thought it was one of those self-referential things where they're saying, I, nobody told me why we had to pull you yeah. out and try to move you over into this other timeline. And we'll just let that other one die a slow death. It's fine. You basically just, you know, we'll move you over to Marvel MCU and we'll just forget that the Fox thing ever happened. It'll die a slow death sort of thing. So I, again, I could be wrong, but that's what I, I got from it. Did you like the Gambit stuff? I was I didn't always follow it. Like, I know that Gambit is a fan favorite and I understand that seeing him in live action would be kind of a big deal and maybe potentially like green light more of that to come in the future. But like, I wasn't really sure why it was Channing Tatum like was Channing Tatum but, perhaps behind the scenes slated to play Gambit at some point and then never got the chance like I just I don't know why that was a thing I don't know I I I don't think so or I should say I've not seen him tied to that role before and 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 I tried to do a bit of research online and people kind of didn't care for him as Gambit because Gambit is typically tall wiry and muscly like he's he's a thin guy he's not just this you know big hulking mm -hmm. channing tatum kind of character and so i'm not i'm not sure what it was and then him having that that hard to uh hard to understand accent it's pretty it's pretty darn funny but i don't know why they had him do that because if he's, if he's going to be gambit somewhere else it's like he almost can't be the butt of a joke if you can barely understand what he's saying so I don't know. Maybe he's just supposed to maybe just supposed to be a variant like that in this and that's it. But no, the gambit that I remember from the cartoon had a southern accent like they're from Louisiana, I think, or that sort of like South New Orleans, that kind of stuff. Okay. And so but but again, like you're also talking about a 90s cartoon. So like that accent would have been a little over the top, too, because it's a cartoon. Right, right. And and, and easier to pull off with the costume and everything else. The, some of the lines and some of the jokes were funny, but I thought the costume looked pretty dumb. <laughs> some costumes just don't really sell it in live action. And that that was one I was like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's really huh. necessary. I wasn't my it wasn't my favorite. Yeah, I would like to see it again. Then I didn't I didn't notice it being off. So I'm curious. Yeah, I feel like you're right. We need to see it again. But the, the costume that I thought was a really fun reveal that I'm glad was in no trailers and no spoilers. And I did not know about it was the penultimate fight scene with wolverine and deadpool and all of the other deadpools coming in from the tva uh warping them in was wolverine pulling up his hood the the yellow and black kind of winged uh wolverine mask that you see <laughs> in all of the comics and i it like it looked pretty good there there were moments where it looked really solid and I mean, immediately gets made fun of. I think Deadpool calls them blowjob handles in the first 30 seconds that he's got it on his head. <laughs> like, it's just it it just like you get you, all the nerds get really excited. And then you're just like, oh, wow, I did not expect that. And yeah. like, it's it's really well done. And in that scene where he puts it on, it looks good and makes sense. It looks great. And yeah. then in other scenes, it made his head look really big. Like it, Hugh Jackman is massive in this movie. Like he put on some serious weight and looks just ripped. His shoulders are huge. But the moment yeah. he puts that cowl over his head and they start doing some action, he looks really narrow. Like he just, it stops all proportions from making sense. And so I admire the fact that they did it and I think it was still worth it. But there were some points there where I was just like, this feels a little bit strange. And then later on, one of my other grievances was that there is a couple of moments with the CG in this film where they really did not pull it off. And there was yeah. a couple of slow motion parts where Deadpool and Wolverine jumping through like the window of a bus or something. And like, yeah. Hugh Jackman was not in that scene. <laughs> like, no, not at all. Very much rubber Wolverine. I was like, mm. and that's where I'm yeah. just like, his head is too big. Like it just does not make sense. <laughs> and then later on, and I don't know why this works with Deadpool and it doesn't with Wolverine, but they animated the mask when Wolverine kind of frowns or does an, a, a, an expression with his eyes, the mask moves and sure yeah. Deadpool's does too. They've done that for three movies now and I never question it. It looks fine. And with Wolverine does it, maybe it's because you can still see part of his real face. It just feels weird. I don't, I don't know what it is about it. It just does not look right. And 
some of the close-ups on angles, it really felt like the eyes on the Wolverine mask were in the wrong spot. And it reminded mm. me of Daredevil, the Netflix Daredevil, because he doesn't need the mask. Like, he, does, he can't see. So he doesn't need right. eyeballs in the right place on the mask. It can just be mean looking, and it doesn't really matter whether it matches up to where Charlie Cox's eyes are. And there's definitely parts in this. And it could be just the fact that you can't see the pupils, right? Like with Batman, at least with the Batman masks, like if he turns his head and looks at the, another character, you can still sort of see where the pupils are. Whereas right. with, with Wolverine, when he turns to look at somebody, he like he still kind of looks like he's looking at the wall beside them. <laughs> and so it kind of felt like a blind mask. So I'd be very curious. I've not heard any interviews with Hugh Jackman talking about what it was like to act or move or fight with that thing on. Like you must not be able to see shit. It has to be like a yeah. white blur, right? I wonder if the entire thing was just CGI'd on the entire time. So maybe he just wore a... Oh, maybe. Maybe just wore like a green hood or whatever that he could see through and they just put it on. But I don't know because I noticed in a trailer when I was watching it again that... Or not a trailer, I guess I should say. It's like a clip that that it's been, it's been put on the internet now. Uh, his beard is different. There's a moment when they're focusing on him talking about like, I put it, I only put it on for the killing or something like that. It's that exchange where Deadpool's making fun of it for a second. And mm. his chops are shorter. So I feel like there's some inconsistency with some of the costuming and the and the grooming where maybe he had to have a shorter beard in order for the hood to fit on and fit well. And then he looks scruffier in other parts of the, of the film, too. So I don't know. It just could maybe they shot that mm. sequence first. I It would make sense. They would shoot a lot of the action first. Anything with his arms bare or his shirt off, they would have shot that first in the, in the filming sequences. Right. Because Jackman would have wanted to maintain that shape as best he could. So. Right. Yeah. No, I just. There was, again, great moment. I'm not saying it was bad, but some of the CG, I was like, mm, I don't know. That kind of took me, the time that kind of took me out of it. I think the only other spots where I was just like, this is really odd was some weird, they weren't jokes that ran too long. It was just weird sentimental moments or slow yeah. moments that were kind of interjected in the middle of an action sequence or immediately after a really good action sequence where you kind of felt the next thing should be running to save the day or running to the next thing and then it goes to like here's a nice soft ballet number You're like what like <laughs> it, just, it felt very non sequitur like it it just it didn't make sense and it it wasn't deal breaking for me but there's just a couple moments just like this is a really odd pace change and you notice it it's mm. like the brakes go on full tilt like you're just screaming to a halt had a couple of uh fun little easter eggs in it as well the Greatest Showman is a movie that we've watched multiple times in my household just because the uh, the family likes the music in it. <laughs> There's one point where when they were fighting in the car, Deadpool grabs Wolverine's head and just smashes it off the radio. And then, and for, I guess for those of you who don't know, Hugh Jackman is the main character in The Greatest Showman. So the, there's a song from The Greatest Showman that starts playing as soon as his, <laughs> as soon as his head bangs off the radio. So there were, there were a couple of uh, excellent little... Uh, Easter eggs in there, then again, I'm sure I've missed more. So it's like, it feels like a second viewing is in order. I'd like to go with somebody that hasn't seen it. Like, I feel like that would be a really good experience seeing it with True. people that have not yet seen it. Cause we would know what was coming. Right. So any final thoughts on Deadpool and Wolverine? I mean, overall, I really, really enjoyed it. I, my, my initial reaction to the ending was that it was a little too tidy just how everything wrapped itself up because there was, you know, it felt like there was going to be peril and there was a good chance that in this final scene that we were going to lose Wolverine or Deadpool or both kind of thing. And then, you know, when they make it through to the end, I thought, well, why would you even warn them that they could die? But then their reasoning for why they didn't, it was, even though it was tidy, it, it totally, it actually was uh it made sense. You know, one of them would have died, but the two of them together were stronger and got the job done. So I'm trying to be objective about it when I rate these things, but like the entertainment value of this was high. I was originally thinking 8.5, but I'll throw in a subjective extra half point there and give it a nine. It was good. It wasn't perfect by any means, but man, it was, it was fun. I, I think that's the thing. Like it's not perfect. And it's the kind of thing where it's hard to nitpick a movie that's breaking the fourth wall every 10 minutes right like it's 
Yeah. Because you, you're just like, well, wait a minute. Because you, you get confused between what's the plot and what's the meta. And I feel like because of that, you kind of have to be along for the ride. Uh, so I'm up there too. I I don't really have a number rating, but like I for me it was just like 100% worth seeing. Would see again. That is not something I say all that often these days. So uh, that's high praise for for me. And as we've been saying, would see in theater again because oh 100% was, uh, yeah yeah really good. I I am a little cautious about the multiverse and how much of that they're going to bring into Marvel because it just ends up being the same sort of trope and and safety net you know insert sci-fi thing here that just causes all kinds of continuity problems and that you just fix by throwing more timeline stuff at it right like you people go into yeah. pre, you keep on going into prequels because you just kind of want to stay in the safe zone and you end up doing all these kind of fan service moments because of where you are in the timeline i'd rather just move forward like i i don't necessarily I don't know enough about the Fantastic Four and how that ties into the multiverse stuff. I feel like it's probably pretty big because Reed Richards is big on the science. So like I I feel like we're kind of going down that road. I hope they handle it with care. Yeah. Uh, I think it's fun that Deadpool's going to be in the Marvel universe, but I'm also excited for <laughs> Hugh Jackman being on contract until he's 90. <laughs> that was a joke <laughs> in the movie. I yeah. I think that that's that's pretty good too and I don't think we'll end up with another deadpool movie but i think we will probably see deadpool in other films if the multiverse takes another dive or if the mcu takes another dive we'll get another oh maybe. deadpool movie yeah another uh, Mar- marvel jesus it's the kind of thing where you, you don't want them to make too many of these right like no no you've no. done three they've all been good two was not the best but it's still good for me and i feel like they really nailed it with three but i feel like if they start to push their luck they might run out mm-hmm not to mention that, like, if they're going to make another one, like Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman are not getting any younger. I mean, they look fantastic. Mm-hmm. But, like, I don't know whether a 65 year old Wolverine <laughs> in 10 years is what yeah. I would want. You know, it's going to be a little bit tricky. Yeah. Speaking of CGI, they'd have to de-age him a, a fair bit at a certain point because he's yeah. supposed to be over t- over 200 years old at the same age that he was back in the day. But mm-hmm. I'll be interested to see how Deadpool does in the MCU because. I've I've really enjoyed the the um the Deadpool movies, but I don't know that I want fourth wall breaking in the middle of like just in the middle of the big Thanos scene. I would not have wanted any kind of like when when Iron Man dies and like all of this stuff's going on. It's and when Captain America's picking up Mjolnir for the first time, I don't need I don't need Deadpool popping up and looking at the screen and going, "Holy crap!" Like you know, dropping like f bombs or whatever he would normally do in his movies. It's like. That's fair. Including him, and it's got to be done. Di- well, it's got to be handled differently than Deadpool movies. So I'll be, I'll be curious to see how they do it. I'm excited to have him around because he's funny, and I think I think he it's got brings you know high entertainment value. But um, I guess that's one thing that I'm sort of cautious about having him in like Avengers: Doom Days and Secret War, like all of the big big moment movies. But we'll see. I could see maybe those post credit scenes though. Deadpool, like, <laughs> he I, should I, be in all of them. Yeah, I think that would be that would be really good. Or like shows up like Stanley in in the Stanley cameos. <laughs> and that could be really funny too. <laughs> Moving into the Internet Minute, which is of course brought to you by you, dear listener. The Citadel Cafe is one hundred percent listener supported. If you get value out of the show, please consider putting a little bit of value back in. You can become a member at patreoncom slash Cafe. Joining at any level will get you an invite to the member-only Discord server and access to the Barista Cut bonus audio sessions whenever we have a chance to record those. Special thanks to our Bean Counter patrons Cosmic and Smurf588. Thank you ever so much for your support on this episode. Patron count is at 24. That's down two from the last time that we recorded. Our goal each time we sit down is to have just one more patron. If you'd like to be patron number 25, visit patreon.com slash Cafe. It's time for Lego, Stephen. It's always time for Lego. Is it? <laughs> it is. Uh, and this is a little unorthodox for me. This just kind of caught my eye because of the color scheme. This is the Lamborghini Countach 5000 Quattrovol. Ooh, neat. I am not a car guy, so this surprises me that this really kind of grabbed me. It is 1,500 pieces, 4 inches high, 7 inches wide, 14 inches long, and retails for about 240 Canadian. This is on the scale of the... Hmm. DeLorean time machine 
that they put out. It's big. Yeah. And it's not a Technic build. This is what really kind of grabbed me because most of the cars that Lego puts out, they have a McLaren right now that's out, but it's a Technic build. And the Technic builds, while cool, they don't have 100% coverage. Like you can kind of see through all kinds yeah. of different parts of it. So it still feels very much like a toy where this feels more like a sculpture. And even though I'm not a car guy, I drive Lamborghinis in Forza Horizon video games. They are my favorite cars. They corner on dimes in those games and you can go like snot. It is really funny to hit 400 kilometers an hour in a video game and still feel uneasy. <laughs> like it's, it's wild. Um, and I really like the classic 80s Countach yeah. 5000. <laughs> And I realized, like, I, I've seen this before, and I'll tell you where. Red Alert, Generation 1 Transformers, is a Lamborghini Fire Chief car. Now, why the Fire Chief car is a Lamborghini, I don't know. Just because it was cool in the 80s, probably. Yeah. Uh, and it is red and white in the same way that Red Alert was red and white. But Red Alert was just a <laughs> repaint of the other Lamborghini Transformers. There's two more. Sideswipe is just a red Lamborghini with a, red, with a black interior. And Sunstreaker was a yellow Lamborghini, I think had a red interior as well. Or, or oh, interior. right. Uh, and, and Sideswipe and Sunstreaker were identical toys. They were just repaints. And so they, they cast them as paternal twins in the TV show. <laughs> so because they looked so much alike in terms of the nice. cars, right? Uh, it was really funny that these like the Autobots hiding in a volcano outside of Bumblebee and Optimus Prime. And a couple of Jeeps, like everybody's a luxury car. There's a Porsche, there's an F1 <laughs> racer. Like it's just what boys are going to be interested in cool cars, you know, in the 80s, right? And uh, the Countach has got really classic 80s lines. It was made in 1988. And like the angles of the rear headlights and the, the taillights rather, spoiler, uh, the angle of the, the hood. Like it's, it's a sharp looking, sharp looking car. I'm going to see if there's a retro lamborghini in forza now i kind of want to paint it white <laughs> and, <laughs> and drive around anyway it, it looks like a cool lego set i again not a car guy but this is a really cool cool vintage i guess vintage we'll call it vintage um because i guess we are vintage also <laughs> oh man well that wraps up this episode of the citadel cafe you can get more information about the show and links to some of the things that steven and i talked about at the citadel cafe.com Music for the show was composed by Kevin McLeod. You can email us at thecitadelcafe at gmail.com or find the show by name on social media. Subscribe for free on all of the major podcasting platforms. The RSS feed is available in the show notes as well as everything else on our website at thecitadelcafe.com. Word of mouth is the easiest way to support the show. Just tell friends about the Citadel Cafe and where they can go to listen to it. My name is Joel Duggan. You can find everything that I am doing online at joelduggan.com. That includes a link to my other podcast all about Minecraft, The Spun Chunks, at thespunchunks.com. We are celebrating six years this week on The Spun Chunks. Wow, nice. Thanks. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. We had a good conversation on this week's show, actually. It was a, it was a good show. You can find me on Twitch and Twitter and all of the other social media at Joel Duggan. I stream Wednesdays through Saturday on Twitch, most of the time playing Minecraft on the Citadel server which we just updated to Minecraft 1.21 today. And on Fridays, I build Lego, also currently a Minecraft-related build. So that's a lot of fun. Steven, where can people find you online? Typically, I'm hanging out on Twitch at twitch.tv slash stevenesc. You've been listening to the Citadel Cafe, where we are fast, easy, and cheap. But you can only pick Deadpool. Deadpool. <laughs>